Uh, I want to welcome you to lecture 10 of this training series on design of seismic resistant RCC residential building based on IS code. In our last lecture, which was lecture 9, we looked at the design of isolated footing. And in today's lecture, we will look at the design of slabs. And in design of slabs, in this lecture, we will only be looking at the theoretical considerations and some codal provisions. And also regarding the general behavior of slabs in our buildings. We will perform the actual design of slabs manually in Excel sheet in our next lecture. In this lecture, we will only look at some codal provisions. So let's begin with our presentation here. I, I have taken some points and some reference diagrams in this lecture and I have taken that from the book Design of Reinforced Concrete Structures by Yan Subramaniam. And I have extracted some or I have taken some screenshots of pictures and some uh, codal provisions and some behavior of slabs from this same book. It's a good book for learning design of reinforced concrete structures written very written in a very plain in a very lucid language and you can also follow this book. So let's begin. What are slabs? Slabs are those structural elements whose thickness is considerably smaller than other dimensions. If you look at our columns or beams, we have dimensions of length, height, width, which are all considerable. Those dimensions were considerable and they could not be neglected. However, in slabs, the thickness is one such dimension which is considerably smaller than other dimensions. and other dimensions means in comparison to the length of the slab or width of the slab. So the function of the slab is to support and transmit loads to the walls or beams supporting them and sometimes transmit the loads directly to the column by flexor, shear and torsion. One function of slab is to support and transmit all the gravity loads to the walls or beams. Our slabs may be resting either as a simply supported slab on walls or they may be cast integrally with the supporting beams. So whatever the support condition be, the slabs support and transmit all the loads coming onto it to the walls or beams. And also another function of slab is to resist lateral wind and earthquake load. We can remember or we have seen that the action of slabs is rigid diaphragms. Our slabs act as rigid diaphragms of great stiffness. And that is important in restricting the lateral deformation of multi-storied frames. So slabs perform major two functions. One is to transmit the loads and another is to resist the lateral forces. Slabs can be solid, ribbed or waffle type. In fact, we will only be looking at the solid slab, design of solid slab, which is the typical slab that we use in our residential buildings. However, our slabs may also be ribbed or waffled or flat slab and the design considerations or the design parameters are different for each type of slab. A slab is generally designed as a flexural element considering a strip of 1 meter width. Even though it is it is case in or uh, there may be error here in one piece and not in strips of unit width. So, while performing the analysis and the design of slabs, we consider unit strips of 1 meter width and we consider them as a beam of 1 meter width and we design for that one strip and then perform the design and analysis of whole slab. If slabs are thin compared to beams, the serviceability limit state of deflection is normally critical in slabs rather than the ultimate limit states of bending and shear. Since slabs have relatively larger surface area compared to their volume, they are more affected by temperature and shrinkage stresses. So these are the properties of our slab. Our slabs can be divided into different types and that basis of division can also be very different. For example, one way to divide our slabs is to divide it on the basis of shape. We will only be performing the design of rectangular or square slabs in this course, but our slabs may also be trapezoidal, circular, triangular, or any other different shape type. 
and slabs can also be div divided on the basis of the support condition the slabs may be simply supported continuous or cantilevered our slabs may be pre-cast pre-stressed or cast in situ or our as we looked in the previous slide our slabs can be solid ribbed waffle slab or flat slab but we will be looking at one particular division and that division of slab is based on the way the slab supports the loads on the basis of this parameter we have one way slab and two way slab so most load is carried in the shorter span in case of one way slab so what is one way slab most load is carried in the shorter span in case of one way slab one way slab behavior is evident when the ratio of the longer span to shorter span is greater than 2 or when a slab is simply supported only along two opposite faces for example let's look at this diagram here if we look at this diagram we have one cantilever slab at the edge we have one cantilever slab at the edge we have another slab here and we have another slab three slabs here these all slabs we can see and another slab we also have here another cantilever slab for all of these slabs our main direction is the shorter direction and most of the load is carried in this shorter direction so for one way action of the slab to occur there are measured two conditions one is that the length of the longer span of this slab the ratio of this longer span to the shorter span should be greater than two or our slab should be simply supported along any two opposite sides <coughs> sorry let's see here another diagram our slab is supported on masonry loads in these two longer sides and this is the side view for our slab our slab is simply supported on these two masonry edges so what will be which will be our primary direction of which will be our primary direction in which our load is transmitted our primary direction will be along the shorter span so our main reinforcement will be distributed in this way along the shorter span and our distribution still will be distributed along this longer span so this is the nature of one way slab whereas in a two way slab the contribution of the longer side to carry loads become more substantial in one way slab most of the load is carried in the shorter span but in the two way slabs the contribution of longer side also becomes significant so why it is called two way slab now it is evident that since the contribution of longer side is also significant the floor is, load is transmitted in two directions that is both shorter side and longer side hence it is called a two way slab so for a two way action either the ratio of the length of the longer side to the length of the shorter side should be less than 2 or the slab should be supported on beams on all sides of each floor then it will be or the then the slab will show a nature of two way load distribution so if you look here <clears throat> this last diagram in this slide this diagram shows the bending nature of one way slab and two way slab suppose this is our one way slab one two three four edges and we see that the bending of this slab in the longer direction this is mainly cylindrical in nature this slab the one way slab in one way or in the longer direction deflects more or less in a cylindrical nature and this deflection is constant along the length of the span almost constant whereas in the shorter direction there is a parabolic deflection this is for one way slab in contrast in a two way slab the deflection is both parabolic along long span and along short span so the deflection is maximum at the center and it decreases towards the edges so this deflection nature also describes the 
differences between one-way slab and two-way slab. So this is about the division of slab based on the nature of load supporting by the slab. So we will be designing a two-way slab in this course. So we will look at the behavior of two-way slab only. We talked about a little about the behavior of one-way slab. If you learn the design of two-way slab, then the design of one-way slab should not be much of a problem. So as we already know, slab is a structural element whose thickness is smaller than other dimensions. Let us look here. In this figure, we have a two-way slab simply supported at all four edges by unyielding supports, that is stiff beams or walls. We have a two-way slab here. And as we looked at in our first slide, we learned there that the design of a two-way slab is based on consideration of a beam of unit width. We consider strips in, we consider strips of unit width along the span of the slab and we design for that unit strip width which we consider a beam of unit width and then we perform the design of whole slab. So one behavior of two-way slab, let's look at one behavior of two-way slab here. Suppose we are considering a unit strip beam along this short direction which is yes one. Suppose this is one strip S1 yes, along the shorter direction and we have another strip along the longer direction L1. So what we see that here, at the intersection of these two strips in the middle, we have a small element and that small element will undergo vertical deflection. This small element which lies at the exact center of the slab will undergo vertical deflection because of the bending moments at the center of the slab and if we consider such similar strips along short direction and longer direction many other such similar strips so let's look at this second figure our original strips were yes one in the center along this shorter span and yell one in the center along this longer span we also selected two other strips, S2, S3 in the shorter direction and L2, L3 in the longer direction. What we will see is that whereas this center small element undergo, underwent or this central element because of the bending moment deflected downwards. In contrast, in other elements, we will see that there is vertical deflection as well as some twisting moments. We can, if you, if you can visualize the nature of these intersecting points here, intersecting points of elements here, you can see that in the center, this element undergoes pure deflection, whereas in the edges, besides deflection, these elements or these cubical elements tend to twist also. So this shows us that besides deflection or besides bending moment, in the particularly in the edges of these slabs. We also have the presence of twisting moments. That means there are torsion in these elements. So, particularly in the edges of the slab, we also have to design for torsional reinforcement in the case of two-way slab. Because in this two-way slab, this since the elements tend to twist at the edges, and but our, our supports are unyielding. We have stiff beams or walls as support. The internal stresses of torsion will be developed here and we will also have to design for torsional reinforcement. So this is the behavior of two-way slab under uniformly distributed load. And how do our slabs fail? Uh, this is another behavior of two-way slab, a mode of failure. Uh, under, you can see these two diagrams here. Under the effect of our uniformly distributed load, first small hairline cracks will appear at the center of the slab and as the intensity of our loading increases this hairline cracks will increase in size and as a result the this yielding of reinforcement at the center of slab occurs the hairline cracks in our cement concrete is transferred these forces are transferred to our reinforcement and yielding of reinforcement occurs and after the yielding of reinforcement occurs, the redistribution of moments takes place. 
that moment is redistributed along those portions which are still left to be yielded or which are still not or where still the cracks have not appeared from the yielded reinforcement the redistribution of moment takes place to the unyielded parts as a result uh, airline cracks start to extend or extrude towards the outward also and the whole reinforcement in the slab starts to yield and as a result the slabs tend to form a mechanism and it fails this is the mode of failure and this is another behavior of two-way slab so let's look at one design consideration and that is the minimum thickness of slab since we know that slab thickness is the primary factor affecting the serviceability and shear strength first if you look at i haven't posted the table here but our we have a table table 16a in is 456 and that table 16a gives us the nominal cover of slab to meet a specified period of fire resistance so one serviceability factor that may affect the thickness of the slab is the fire resistance of the slab and that fire resistance consideration is given in table 16a of is 456 and in clause 23.2 which you can see here control of deflection criteria actually this clause 23.2 is the criteria for beams this clause gives us the vertical deflection limits for beams but these criteria are also applicable to slabs since we already know the design of slab is based on consideration of beams of unit width we consider the strips of unit width and hence design for the beam so this control of deflection criteria is also applicable to the design of slabs so what does this say the deflection of a structure or part thereof shall not adversely affect the appearance or efficiency of the structure or finishes or partitions the deflection shall generally be limited to the following so these are these a and b are two deflection limits first the final deflection due to all loads including the effects of temperature creep and shrinkage and measured from the edge cast level of the supports of floors roofs and all other horizontal members should not normally exceed span by 250 and the deflection including the effects of temperature creep and shrinkage occurring after erection of partitions and the application of finishes should not normally exceed span by 350 or 20 mm whichever is applicable so these two clauses 23.2 a and b gives us the deflection limits and these deflection limits are generally assumed to be satisfied this is in another clause 23.2.1 the vertical deflection limits may generally be assumed to be satisfied provided that the span to depth ratios are not greater than the values obtained as below we have seen we have talked about these clauses a b c and d in the preliminary design of our beams and in the preliminary design of our slabs what we did there was that based on the nature of our slabs we first took a basic value for span to effective depth and these basic values were then modified based on different considerations for example one was the consideration in which the span was greater than 10 meter another consideration was the amount of tension reinforcement which we saw in figure 4 there was a graph and from that graph we obtained the modifying factor based on tension reinforcement and another modifying factor was based on compression reinforcement which was as per figure 5 you can revisit our lecture on preliminary design and i have discussed in detail there so first we obtain the basic values and these basic values are multiplied by different factors based on different conditions and these vertical deflection limit are checked based on these ratios and finally in clause 24 in solid slabs clause 24 gives us some considerations for solid slabs besides the condition that the provisions of clause 23.2 for beams also apply to slabs that is this control of deflection clause there are two short notes here for example number one for slabs spanning in two directions that is two-way slab 
The sorter of the two spans should be used for calculating the span to effective depth ratios. So we saw here 23.2.1a, we had to find the ratio of span to effective depth. And in case of two-way slabs, the sorted span should be taken for calculating the span to effective depth ratios. And for two-way slabs of sorted spans up to 3.5 meter with mild steel reinforcement, the span to overall depth ratios given below may generally be assumed to satisfy vertical deflection limit for loading class up to 3 kN per meter square. We have two basic values here for simply supported slabs 35 for continuous slab 40 and for high strength deformed bars of grade 4e fe 415 the values above should be multiplied by 0 0.8 these values are for mild steel reinforcement and for high strength deformed bars these values should be multiplied by factor 0 0.8 so these clauses 23.2 and 24 is the codal provision for checking the minimum thickness of slabs although slab thickness is not or we'll talk about it later let's leave it here these are the codal provisions for minimum thickness of slabs so let's look at the analysis of wall supported slabs here Clause 24.3 talks us about slabs monolithic with supports. Bending moments in slabs except flat slab constructed monolithically with the supports shall be calculated by taking such slabs either as continuous over supports and capable of free rotation or as members of a continuous framework with the supports taking into account the stiffness of such supports. If such supports are formed due to beams which justify fixity at the support of slabs, then the effects on the supporting beam, such as the bending of the wave in the transverse direction of the beam and the torsion in the longitudinal direction of the beam wherever applicable, shall be considered in the design of the beam. So this clause 24.3 states the method of design of slabs. How do we design up the slabs? It says that if our slabs are either if our slabs are constructed monolithically with the supports, then in that case, bending moment should be taken either considering that our slabs are continuous over supports and capable of free rotation, or our slabs are members of a continuous framework with the supports, and we have to take into account the stiffness of such supports. For the purpose of calculation of moments in slabs in a monolithic structure, it will generally be sufficiently accurate to assume that members connected to the ends of such slabs are fixed in position and direction at the ends remote from their connections with the slabs. And this major or most important clause in the design of slabs is this clause 24.4, which says that for slabs spanning in two directions at right angles, that is for two way slab. We can design the slab by using the coefficients given in NXD. NXD of IS-456 has table for coefficients for both simply supported and restrained slabs. And the slabs may be designed by using those coefficients given in NXD. We will talk about that coefficient in our upcoming slides here. For determining bending moments in the slabs spanning in two directions at right angles and carrying concentrated load, any accepted method approved by the engineer in charge may be adopted. So, NXD is the case for uniformly distributed load, which is mostly the cases in our residential buildings. So, we will design our slabs based on NXD here. So, clause 24.4 gives us the design procedure for two way slabs. Let's look here before going to those factors and before going to that nxd let us look a little about the analysis of wall supported slabs and let us look at the nature of transfer of loads of those two-way slabs here we have two sets of diagrams here first we have for square slab 
and this will be for the ratio l y by l x is equal to one and in the right hand side we have for the ratio l y by l x is equal to two these two diagrams gives us or show us the nature of <coughs> sorry these two diagrams show us the nature of the trajectory or the path of the principal moments in our slabs how are those principal moments distributed or how are those principal moments transferred to the support in our slabs these are our contour lines or the trajectory lines of our principal moments so look here we have one solid lines at the center and these solid lines represent positive bending moments that means tension at the bottom surface in our edges we have dashed lines which are negative bending moments and we have boundary line here separating positive and negative bending moments look here these are the boundary lines separating positive and negative bending moments you can also see these boundary lines here on this left hand side diagrams and these represent the change of sign of moments and what you have to understand from these diagrams is that first structures generally have a tendency to transmit loads that, that are acting on them to the supporting systems along the shortest possible path that means any element tends to transfer the loads acting on that element to its supporting element and that transfer is most possibly done through the shortest possible load path so let's see here in this let's look at this trajectory here let's look at this line here this is almost the center of our slab and what happens is that in this central region since this is the longer direction l y in the central region in this longer direction of the slab this direction of principal moment is shown by these trajectory lines is nearly perpendicular to the supports that means let's look here for this diagram all edges are fixed all the four edges are fixed and for this diagram we have simply supported edges so what happens is that in this central region the direction of principal moment is shown by these trajectory lines is nearly perpendicular to the supports because you can see that if this is our supports here if this is our supports on the shorter side then this line is nearly perpendicular to these supports this line is nearly perpendicular to these supports so the load is mainly transferred in the shorter direction since perpendicular line is the shortest line and that gives us the shortest possible load path these bending moments at our center and remember the bending moment at the center is the maximum bending moment in our slabs so these bending moments in the center are mainly transferred to the shorter edges so what we can infer from this diagram is that or what we can infer from this trajectory of principal moments is that the moments in our shorter direction which is yum yux is generally greater than the moments in our longer direction why is it so because we have maximum bending moment at the center of the slab and that maximum bending moment is generally transferred to the shortest possible load path and based on this trajectory of our principal moments we see that since these lines are perpendicular to the support or the shorter side these moments at the center these maximum moments at the center are transferred to the shorter side hence the moment in the shorter side is greater than the moment in the longer side so, so some moments are also transferred in this longer side and mainly the moments at the center of this slab are transported or transferred to the shorter side hence the mx is greater than my and in the edges as we talked about before that there is the presence of torsional moments these dotted inclined lines show us the moments in the corner regions and these moments are inclined to the support 
so this means there are twisting moment at the corner as you can see for this corner this corner these all four corners are the corners in here you can also look at this diagram there are twisting moments at the corner since our trajectory lines of principal moments are inclined to the support so there will be twisting moment in the corner and we have to design for torsional reinforcement so this is the general behavior of wall supported slabs and we saw the trajectories of principal moments in beam supported rectangular slabs here and also continuing from the previous slide we saw that we had uh, negative moments at the edges let's see here first we saw that these dotted lines represented negative moments at the edges of the slab. So, here this shaded region represents the negative moments. This A diagram is for simply supported slab, and this B diagram is for slabs with fixed ends. As you can see here, the edges for or the reason for negative bending moments is generally for the shorter span it is 0.18 times the length of the shorter span and for the longer span 0.18 times the length of the longer span this gives us the approximate reason of negative bending moment in the case of simply supported slab whereas in the case of slabs with fixed end the reason of negative bending moment is given by 0.18 times yx 0.18 times length of shorter span in both directions whether it be shorter side or longer side the reason of negative bending moment is 0.18 times the length of the shorter side so this is the difference in the simply supported slab it was length of that particular side in which we were looking at bending moment if it was in shorter side 0.18 times lx or if it was in longer side 0.18 times ly whereas in the case of slabs with fixed end, the reason is 0.18 times LX at both ends. And all these results are derived, experimental results, and these are derived, these values are derived from those experimental results. So this is the nature of negative bending moment, or these are the reasons of negative bending moments in rectangular slabs. And for all slabs, we are looking for the uniformly distributed loads on the slab. Now, let us come to our codal provisions. Or we saw that we had some bending moment coefficients given in NX D of IS 456. So, actually, how were those bending moment coefficients derived, or what are what is the basis of those bending moment coefficients? Let's see here, I have written here Grassoff-Rankin method. Those coefficients are based on Grassoff-Rankin method. And these coefficients were derived by two, two people, Franz Grassoff and William Rankin. So based on the name of those two people, we have this Grassoff-Rankin method. And these bending moment coefficients are derived as an approximate method for the analysis of simply supported rectangular slabs. So what Grassoff and Rankin did is that they considered the slab to be divided into a series of orthogonal unit beam strips. We saw this already in our previous slide. And considering the two middle strips, let us look here. The same two middle strips, the deflection at their common intersection point will be the same. So the deflection of this common intersection point can be calculated based on the deflection of the shorter side and based on the deflection of the longer side. And since this point is the one point, that same point for both directions, then either the deflection from longer side or the deflection from the shorter side, this should both be equal. Since these are the strips of this same monolithic slab. So this is the formula for deflection of shorter side and for longer side. Where Wx and Wy are the share of uniformly distributed load for each strip. Lx and Ly are the length of longer, length of shorter and longer side respectively. 
and ix and iy are the moment of inertia in the x direction and y direction suppose that the moment of inertia is the same that is ix is equal to iy then we get this formula wx by wy is equal to ly to the power 4 divided by lx to the power 4 what this formula gives us is that here since ly is greater than lx so the value of wx should be greater than w1 that means a larger share of load is carried in the shorter direction as we have already seen the nature of these two way slab in our previous slides a larger share of load is taken in the shorter direction so finally we will get these two formulas for moment in the x direction that is in the shorter direction and y direction alpha x w u l x square and alpha y w u l x square where alpha x is here and alpha y is here and r means the ratio of the longer side to the shorter side that is aspect ratio you use the value of r and determine alpha x and alpha y and then use alpha x and alpha y to calculate the moments in the slab and remember here do not be confused the length is <clears throat> length of shorter direction in both of these formula mx and my so these formula are given in clause d 2.1 of our code is 456 and also given in table 27 so in this way we calculate the moments acting on our slabs <clears throat> that was the case for simply supported slabs now let us look at the case for restrained slabs that means those slabs that are cast integrally with the beams and in which the corners are prevented from lifting that means there is the provision for torsional reinforcement made at simply supported corners and our slabs may be continuous or discontinuous at the edges so these all of these design considerations i have extracted from nx d of is 456 let us i will just read these clauses and if there is any description to be made i will do that first slabs are considered is divided in each direction into middle strips and edge strips is given in figure 25 here you can see the division of middle strip and edge strip but for both shorter and longer direction the middle strip being three quarters of the width that is 3 by 4 ly or 3 by 4 lx and edge strip one eighth of the width that is ly by 8 for the longer direction and lx by 8 for the shorter direction the maximum moments calculated is in d 1.1 apply only to middle strips and no redistribution shall be made that is clause d point d 1.1 has formula in it we will look at that formula and that those moments calculated from that formula is only applicable to the middle strips Tension reinforcement provided at mid span in the middle strip shall extend in the lower part of the slab to within 0.25 L of a continuous edge or 0.15 L of a discontinuous edge. These are the clauses of detailing. We will look at the detailing of reinforced structures, reinforced concrete structures, including all elements, footing, beam, column, slab in a particular or in a different training course. In this course we are only looking at the design so clause d1.4 talks about the detailing and d1.5 also detailing criteria over the continuous edges of a middle strip the tension reinforcement shall extend in the upper part of the slab at a distance of 0.15 l from the support and at least 50 percent shall extend the distance of 0.3 l d1.6 is also about detailing i am not going through it d1.7 reinforcement in edge strip parallel to the edge shall comply with the minimum given in section 3 and the requirements for torsion given in 1.8 and 1.10 so we were talking about the reinforcement calculation in the middle strip up to now and d1.7 clause talks about the reinforcement in edge strip that should be based on either the torsion reinforcement given in d 1.8 and 1.10 or the minimum given in section 3 torsion reinforcement let's look about torsion reinforcement here 
It shall be provided at any corner where the slab is simply supported on both edges meeting at that corner. It shall consist of top and bottom reinforcement, each with layers of bars placed parallel to the sides of the slab and extending from the edges a minimum distance of one-fifth of the shorter span. The area of reinforcement in each of these four layers shall be three quarters of the area. The area of reinforcement in each of these four layers shall be three quarters of the area required for the maximum mid span moment in the slab. We will look at this in, de in design part also in detail. And D1.9 torsion reinforcement equal to half that described in D1.8 shall be provided at a corner contained by edges over only one of which the slab is continuous. Torsion reinforcement need not be provided at any corner contained by edges over both of which the slab is continuous. That means if we have slab here and this is continuous on all four directions and we have slabs here also then that means for the design of this mid slab torsion reinforcement need not be provided because these are all restrained by support due to the continuous slabs and torsion ly by lx is greater than 2 the slab shall be designed as spanning one way that we have already seen so section d or nxd of this is456 mainly talks about reinforcement detailing and torsion reinforcement in our slabs we will look at these conditions or these codal provisions in our next design class also i just went through this quickly i did not make any description here we will look at this during the design of our slabs because at that time this will be more clearer to you and up to now we talked about the bending moments in our slabs now let's talk about the shear forces in two-way slabs Shear forces are not the governing or the design criteria for slabs. Our slabs are mainly affected by the bending moment. So for the design of shear forces, so we also have to look at the distribution of shear forces. We looked at the distribution of moments in our previous slide. And for the distribution of our shear forces, what we have is that we will check for shear forces or our critical section for one-way shear is at a distance of d from this support we also saw this criteria if you can remember while designing an individual isolated footing we checked for one way shear at a distance of d from the face of the column and this one way shear is again critical here in the case of our solid slabs and that is at a distance at a distance of d from the face of the support or from the support also we need not check for two-way or punching shear in our case of slabs which are supported on beams our two-way shear may be more critical or more predominant in our flat slabs in that is in our slabs where there are no beams to support the slabs the slabs rest directly on the columns our two-way or punching shear is critical in that but for our slab supporting on beams our two-way shear is not critical so we just check for one-way shear and this maximum shear force per unit width is given by W into shaded area. W into shaded area here. And the area of this shaded area is 0.5 times LXN. That means 0.5 times the effective length of this shorter direction minus D. Minus effective depth of this slab into W which is uniformly distributed load. This gives us the maximum shear force per unit width in our slab. And these, and then we calculate. After the calculation of the maximum shear force per unit width, we calculate the nominal shear force. And that nominal shear force is given by shear stress divided by BD. This gives us, sorry, nominal shear stress is given by nominal shear force divided by area that is bd and what we have the condition is that clause 40.2.3.1 of is 456 code states that for solid slabs the nominal shear stress which is this value should not exceed 
half the appropriate values given in table 20. In table 20, we have the maximum shear stress in concrete for different grades of concrete. And for the grade of concrete that we are using, this nominal shear stress should not exceed the half of the value of tau C max. And also, 40.2.1.1 states for solid slab, the design shear strength for concrete shall be k into tau C, where k has the following values. The values of k is dependent on the overall depth of the slab. So, if the value of our nominal shear stress is less than 0.5 times the appropriate value given in table 20, then we need not design for sorry if the value of our nominal shear stress tau u is less than k into tau c k into tau c we need not design for shear stress in the slab whereas if our value of nominal shear stress is greater than k into tau c but less than 0 0.5 that means half of tau c max which is given in table 20 then we have to design for the shear stress in slabs also generally shear stress we do not get a large value of shear stress because that is not the principal governing criteria for the design of our slabs generally shear reinforcement is not required so this brings us to the end of our lecture in this lecture 10, we saw some codal provisions regarding the design of slabs. Uh, in the end, let me just go to NXD. Here we have NXD of IS-456. This NXD is based on clause 24.4 and 37.1.2 for slabs spanning in two directions, that is two-way slabs. You can go through this codal provisions or you can go through this section of the code by yourself also. We saw that we had formula in D1.1, this formula for MX and MY. We looked at these codal provisions from D1.2 to D1.11 here that talked mostly about the reinforcement detailing in those two-way slabs and for torsional reinforcement design. And in section D2, we have for simply supported slabs. D2 there are conditions or clauses for simply supported slabs and we have two tables here in table 27 we have pending moment coefficient for slabs spanning in two directions that is for two-way slab which are simply supported on all four sides the value of bending moment coefficients alpha x and alpha y based on different values of aspect ratio and in table 26 we have bending moment coefficient for Rectangular panels supported on four sides with provision for torsion head corners. For different types of panel and moments considered, we have the values of alpha x and alpha y. We will look at this code once again during the design of our slab in our next lecture. So this is the end of our lecture 10. We will be back very soon. Thank you.